Good evening. Wait, let's try it again. Good evening. Thank you. If your students are as lackluster as that, we will definitely do that quite a bit. So how many of you were here um, for my song and dance the first hour? Okay, I'll try to keep the first part really brief. Um, I want to welcome you to Greyhearts Western Hills. This is a parent summit night. I was encouraged to do tonight because um, people, frankly, just said this is the third time we've had somebody leading the school. We have lots of questions. Um, and that there was a lot of things that we did at the kinder orientation in May, and everybody walked away saying, you've got to tell every parent that's here all of those things because that's going to make all the difference in the world. So that's what we put together tonight. Thank you for coming out. I'm sure most of you worked a long day and this is the last thing you want to be doing is sitting in one of these folding chairs. Um, so thank you so much. It means a lot to us to see all of your faces here. You are here because you have a fifth through eighth grade teenage, almost teenage animal. Yes, we love them. Um, I am a recent almost empty nester. I have two Great Hearts graduates myself. One graduated in 2018 from Great Hearts Monta Vista, and then I had a son who graduated just this last spring from Great Hearts Northern Oaks. We were Great Hearts parents back in Arizona. I had my daughter started in the seventh grade, and my son started in the fifth grade. And when, after I had experienced Great Hearts first as a parent, then as a volleyball coach, then as a teacher, and I heard that there was a need and a desire for families to have the same education here in San Antonio. I answered the call in 2015 and came here. Um, I am dedicated to what it is that Great Hearts gives as an option, a charter school option to families, and I'm, I'll be really blunt, I think this is the best way to educate children. I'm excited for the man and woman that my two children are. I'm lucky my daughter graduated and married a Great Hearts grad. Yes. So we have lots of books at my house. They have lots of books in their little apartment. And we have lots of fabulous and wonderful conversations. Um, and I am proud of the man and woman that they, they're still in the process of becoming. They're not yet 25 yet. So there's still a lot of growth to do. But I love the foundation that the teachers at both Monta Vista and Northern Oaks invested in them. They invested in them. They walked alongside of them. Many of them um, really challenged my children. And then once they left, handed them their cell phone numbers and said, now we are friends. And they, uh, they regularly have either coffee on a Saturday morning or just text and ask questions. So I appreciate that about the Great Hearts faculty members who have invested in my children. So my hope is to be able to give you that same gift. I want to just share briefly the beginning. I share this with faculty every year. Um, I said it, share it with new faculty at new faculty orientation. Um, but one of the things that our goal is as parents and hopefully is yours as well is that we are hoping it isn't moving. I don't know where Ryan is. Um, we're hoping to raise sturdy children. And uh, sturdy children don't happen without intentionality, especially in this day and age. I told a story in the first section about a, a boy who, uh, actually he was a, a man in his 80s who was telling the story of being a boy uh, and spending the summer on his grandfather's farm. And all the things that went into uh, the work in just one day. So one day while he was on the farm, uh, it started with getting up really early before it was even light outside and before he had breakfast, he had already fed and watered all of the animals in the barn and he had set um, and, and had basically taken care of the chores that his grandfather normally would have done, had a quick breakfast with grandmother in the kitchen and then they were out in the fields before it was uh, completely light. They had already strapped the plowshare to the back of a horse team and uh, he was guiding the horses while his grandfather was gu guiding the plowshare. Not long into the process of plowing straight rows for corn, the plowshare made a loud, bad sound. It cracked. And uh, the boy, I'm sure he thought, great, I'm going to go inside and play video games for the rest of the day. No. Grandpa looked at him and said, thank goodness this happened early. It gives us time to be able to hitch 
the horses to the wagon, put the plowshare in the back of it, drive into town, get it fixed and come back and get some rows uh, done before the end of the day. So that's exactly what they did. They, uh, the boy, being about 10 years old, he helped grandpa take that plowshare off the back of the team of horses, put it in the back of the wagon that was in the barn, take it an hour and a half into town. They waited around in town while the blacksmith fixed that plowshare, put it back into the back of that wagon, rode the hour and a half back into uh, the farm outside of the city, and, well, probably time to just hit the swimming hole because it was about four o'clock. No, thank goodness there's plenty of light until nine o'clock. And so uh, grandpa said, take that uh, team of horses back over to the barn and leave the wagon there. Come bring them back out to the field. We're going to attach that plowshare and you're going to get back at it. You're going to guide the horses. I'm going to guide the, the plowshare. And they were able to get a few rows done before the end of the day. Uh, before the light was gone. They met up at the end of the evening in the kitchen where Grandma, she had made dinner for five o'clock, but they kept it warm on the stove. And as they're sitting there eating the leftovers that had been waiting for them, Grandma looks at the boy and says, so was it a good day? Sort of a good day, right? And Grandpa jumps over and slaps him on the shoulder and says, it was a really good day. I don't know. If that would have been the reaction of any one of your 10, 11, or 12-year-olds, they probably would have hopped on social media and told all of their friends how they've been misused and abused. Yeah. What they did in that one day, it was a success because they managed to not only find a way to fix the thing that was everything to do with their livelihood, but they got back in time to get back at it. So that was gratitude. There was a desire to be grateful for what it is that they had. One of the things that goes into making us strong people are the hardships that we all go through and come out on the other side of. Our children today are faced with things that are extremely easy, but very convoluted. That boy back in the 1940s and 30s, he had things very hard, but it was simple, really simple. There wasn't a whole lot vying for his attention. No video games, no movies, no internet, no bad things he's got to avoid. And mom and dad had, didn't have as much difficulty making sure that their son was not being corrupted by things out there that wanted to vie for his attention. And you as a parent today, I don't know if about you, but I would love to have that phone back on the wall with a really short cord. Because if you gotta have a conversation in the kitchen where everybody else is, you're probably not gonna have that conversation. And if you don't have that conversation, then there's not gonna be any gossip, and then there's not gonna be any mean girls, and then there's not gonna be any bullying, and everybody's just gonna have that conversation at school, and they're only gonna talk about those things that they have in common, and there's not so many things that they don't have in common, because the internet and the social media world has so many things that's now dividing us instead of bringing us together. And so I would long for the simplicity of there's just a big wide world, and go out there and play and don't come back till dark. Because they might fall out of a tree, but he's not going to see anything that his eyes shouldn't see. And so I hope that by coming to Gray Hearts, what you're hoping for are some of the same things that we are, and that we would like to be more careful about what we introduce to our kiddos, that we want to create an environment for them in which they don't have to make a decision between something ugly and something good but that there's only variations of goodness that they get to enjoy here. And that doesn't happen by just saying, leave that all out there. Lots of things vying for their attention today. And so we realize that if we ask you and your child to leave pop culture outside of the academy, we have to fill it with something. Otherwise, our students will fill it with something. And so since we have been in their shoes, and we know how hard it is to be a teenager and go through all of the changes that are happening in our bodies and all of the different sort of things that are difficult about being in a social circle. We want to build for them. How do we live in community together? How do we grow our own personal identity? And how do we be a part of something bigger than ourselves and care about something other than ourselves? Um, and so that's what I hope I'm inviting to you to be a part of here at Great Hearts Western Hills. 
Our mission is always the same as a Great Hearts family. We're hoping to cultivate the hearts and minds of our children. And I want to point out the word there is cultivate. I don't want to inculcate. I don't want to indoctrinate. I want to walk alongside, and I know that our leadership team wants to walk alongside of your child, and we're going to do a little bit of digging around the plant, and we're going to pull out some weeds and try to keep those weeds from choking the life out of your child. We're going to water them as much and, and grow their curiosity and, give, and invite them to things that they may not have been aware of. Hopefully, it'll rain once in a while with some joyful activities, but we want to cultivate those things in them. If they never see a beautiful painting, if they never hear beautiful music, if they never read good literature, then they don't know what, is, what they're missing. And so for much of what we're going to be doing are things that are a gift to them, that they had no idea was a gift, except that they got it here. And someday they'll look back and hopefully appreciate it. So our vision here at Western Hills is to bring a level of flourishing. How many of you have been uh, with Great Hearts Western Hills since the first year it opened? Thank you. Thank you for coming back every year. Thank you for believing in what it is that Great Hearts um, was hoping to do. I know that it's been a rough three years, and I actually had a question in the, uh, the question link that was sent out. So you're the third headmaster. How long do you plan on staying? It's a valid question, but I invested my life here into San Antonio. My kids have decided to make this home, and I knew that when I took this job that I couldn't take this job and take it as just a stepping stone to something else. I love being at the academy. I love growing faculty culture. I love growing student culture. And I've been gifted a parent with those things, so I want to gift that for you. I wouldn't have taken this job if I was just here for a year or two. Okay, so I want to, uh, unless the Lord takes me home, I'll be here, okay? So we, uh, we are an intentional community. What we do here... Um, we want your child to flourish. I want it to go from the survival of the last three years to flourishing. That means thriving, doing those sort of things that reminds you about what it is good to be human being. Um, so we want to be able to give them those opportunities. Um, we're also a community of learners who are in the process of something. A process means that we haven't arrived and we probably won't ever arrive. It's a process. So a process of learning to love something that maybe is completely foreign to them much of what we do at a Great Heart School is completely countercultural. There isn't a lot of other schools out there doing what we do who are, going to, who are going to line the walls with paintings instead of posters with kitty cats saying, hang in there. We want them to, be, we want them to, to admire things that are of the highest pieces of culture that are a part of their heritage and they don't know it yet. And your children as fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are becoming young men and women. And we want them to know what it means to be a cultured person and be well-rounded. Nothing wrong with pop culture. There's all kinds of interesting things out there, but who knows what parts of those things won't end up in the dustbins of history. Why waste our time with them? We don't have that much time. There's only so many waking hours that we have and only so much time to read good books, listen to great music, and discuss great things. So that's what we're here to do. I want to introduce some of our leadership team members. Uh, our assistant headmaster, Marcy Mitchell, she is the assistant headmaster for K through 8. Because we're one school this year, we need somebody who knew everything that was going on. Our assistant headmaster, Heather Mulder, is, uh, works with grades three through eight, five. And if you were here last year, you know uh, Manuela Kochi. She will be our assistant headmaster of six through eight. She's not here this evening. I want to meet, uh, you to meet uh, Graylin Griffin as our dean of students for students in fifth through eighth grade. He's new to the, uh, to the faculty community. He's also a new parent. He's got a kindergartner coming on Wednesday. Yep, he will be at Tissues and Tacos. Yeah, so we're excited to have him with us. Um, we also have uh, our Dean of Intervention and our Special Education Coordinator and our 504 Coordinator are uh, not with us tonight, but uh, when we get to the handbook, and if you've got some sticky note tabs, you'll be able to stick those in there. Uh, but we, there's a page in there that lists everybody, so if you ever think, gosh, I, I think I need to talk to somebody else about this, you will know who to go to. This is a parent partnership. Uh, we aren't the experts on your child. You are. 
And we have just uh, come, are coming alongside of you in an effort to help not only teach them the fundamentals of education, of reading and writing and math, but we also want to offer them things like drama. Eighth graders are going to get drama this year. Uh, we want to offer them music, studio, art, language. We want to give them those things. And then we also want to build a whole lot of cultural pieces. And we'll be talking about that here in a second. So we want to come alongside of you. So if you have a frustration or we have a frustration, we need to be communicating with each other. Uh, and our whole goal is to do that in a spirit of goodwill. We're going to assume the best in you. And I hope that you will give us and assume the best in us. And there's going to be some days where you're thinking, that is crazy nuts. If that per teacher really did that, I'm going right down there and marching down there. Please ask us questions, find out what happened, and maybe we have done something wrong and we need to fix it. But please give us the opportunity to uh, bring clarity to the situation and help us find a resolution. So there is um, a lines of communication that I hope that you will follow. Uh, if your first question is always to the teacher, for you to parents who have 7th and 8th grade students, if it happened in pre-algebra class, reach out to the pre-algebra teacher. If it happened in music, reach out to the music teacher. So please go to the teacher first. If you email me first, I'll ask you, so what the teacher say? So to avoid that, um, if you do go to the teacher and you don't feel it's resolved or you would like to reach out to the teacher but you'd like one of us to know right away, feel free to add uh, me on there, address the teacher, go ahead and add me on there. The teachers aren't threatened by that. They know that that's part of the way we do things here and they should not be embarrassed to have the headmaster on an email exchange about something um, as long as we're all here for the best of the students. Um, so make sure that after you have asked the question of the teacher and you still need more clarity, if it has something to do with student discipline, let's say that the student uh, disrupted the classroom community that day and had a visit with Mr. Griffin, um, and you would copy the teacher and you would copy Mr. Griffin. If it has something more to do with curriculum, has to do with the fact that your child is struggling in pre-algebra um, and you're not sure if this is the best fit for him, reach out to the teacher and reach out to Maniola Kochi so that they can have that conversation. Of course, at the end of the day, we want to help come to some sort of resolution and we're happy to have a parent meeting um, and bring some clarity. Ordered joy is something that we like to describe our classrooms. If there is no order, there's no room for joy. And I imagine that this sounds a little nuts if you've got a seventh grader who can't keep their room clean, you think that they didn't really care about order, but I guarantee you if you sent somebody in there to clean it for them, they would love it. They just don't wanna do it themselves, right? So we know that we as human beings desire some sort of predictability. We want to know what's going to happen next, and our hearts feel at home when there is some sense of order. What happens is, though, we live in a world of chaos and disorder, and sometimes if we've never learned how to build good habits in our own lives, then we struggle. And so what we want to do is start your child out with body uh, habits of the body and habits of the mind. So we are going to create order in the classroom so that we can do a whole lot of joyful things inside that classroom. So we talk about the habit, we're going to talk about three kinds of habits, the habits of the body, the habits of the mind, and then we're going to talk about habits of virtue. So if you ask a sixth grader to sit up in his seat, it's not because we are a military academy, but because if he is in a slouch, he's most likely to take a nap than he is to pay attention. And we just know that. We know that about our human bodies, that there are positions in which we can sit, that we are more engaged versus ones that are, make us ready to sleep. Um, if I am sitting in a table where I'm always sitting facing three other people, I'm less likely to listen to the teacher and I'm gonna be distracted by those children. So we've ordered our classrooms in specific ways. And when they're ready for a different structure, so as your children are in seventh and eighth grade, they will do some U-shaped rooms in which they will have a discussion in literature and they can be facing the student across the room because we've built the body habits early and they learn how to avoid distractions even if they are facing their peers. But it's the best way for them to have a conversation. So we want them organized that way. Habits of the mind are those things like study skills. So we're gonna be teaching kids since the time they're in kindergarten how to take notes. Kindergarten, they're gonna do a lot of cutting and pasting. 
Maybe they're going to paste something from history in there and they're going to scribble a word underneath it that's hardly legible. But that's the beginning of notes. By the time they're in seventh and eighth grade, we're going to expect it's on the board, it's in your spiral. And then we're going to teach you how to take what's in your spiral to apply it to a study guide. And then to take the study guide maybe into three by five flashcards so that you know how to study. So we're going to teach them those habits of the body, habits of the mind, and then habits of virtue. Hopefully, by the time they reach college, they will panic if they don't have a spiral when they're sitting in a lecture hall because they know that everything that's being said has got to somehow get on paper. And it's going to be this natural habit for them. It won't be an extra task. Um, so that's our goal, build habits. The habits of virtue um, begin with building the moral imagination. Wonderful book, if you're interested in it. His name is Dr. Gurion. He wrote a book called Tending the Heart of Virtue. And you can get it on Amazon. Uh, he will be coming to speak to the faculty at the end of this year for uh, a Great Hearts faculty in service. He wrote a book talking about the fact that stories are one of the ways in which human beings learn the difference between right and wrong. And that we grow our moral imagination when we vicariously live through the mishaps and good choices of characters and stories. There's a lot that your student will learn in Tom Sawyer. A lot that they will learn in Across Five Aprils. A lot they will learn in maybe Treasure Island or in Anne of Green Gables. And eventually they will learn in Brothers Karmazov. Stories of characters who make poor decisions and characters who make valiant decisions and courageous decisions. And they can say for themselves, I see how that character behaved. I don't have to make that mistake myself. And I admire that character, and I want those qualities myself. So growing the moral imagination is one of the ways that we grow their habits of virtue. The second one is actually exercising them. And that's the beauty of having so many stories as a part of their life together here. They're all in common. So I don't have to say, you know that movie you might have seen about, you know, that it's called the movie Babe. I don't have to do that. No, I never saw that. Do you know the story we read last week? And we were talking about Anne of Green Gables. And you remember how Anne and Gilbert got into this discussion and then a slight scuffle in the classroom and he dipped her ends of her hair into the ink pots? And you have this conversation about that because it's all in common. And then we draw connections about behaviors and choices because of those stories that we have in common. And we'll do that a lot this next year. Student habits are built through relationships. I talked to you about the relationships that my own children experienced with Great Hearts teachers, and that's one of the things I hope your children connect with one or two of their teachers. They're going to walk alongside of them. I think of them like shepherds. Think of a shepherd. He has a crook. He has this long staff, and it's got this crook in the top of it, and the, both pieces of it are very important to his job as a shepherd. He picks it up like this, and he uses it like this, and he actually uses the staff part of it to beat away the enemy. And I see that as our teachers fending off falsehood, things that are untrue, helping students to see reality, helping them to have conversations around true and good and beautiful things. And sometimes it needs the crook, and the crook actually takes, he would take it, uh, the hook around the top, would ground the, the sheep around their neck and pull them back just as they were trying to leap over a cliff. Every once in a while, and maybe this is something you would do as a parent, sometimes the shepherd actually had to break the back legs of the, of the lamb's uh, lack two legs because he was just going to run headlong off the cliff. And then you know what that shepherd did? He carried him. He didn't just break his legs and leave him there. He carried them where he needed to go. And sometimes our children are so hurt and maybe they are struggling so poorly, and we are going to help you as you carry your child because they are struggling. So part of what we hope to do this year is build relationships with your students, help them to see truths about themselves, own mistakes, and then find ways to retie those strings of relationship. If your child disrupts the classroom, we will ask them to step outside the classroom because they have violated that space and that relationship, not only with the teacher, but with the other students there. But when they are ready to make a better decision, we want to welcome them back into that space. And a lot of times, the student doesn't know. I know the teacher's mad at me. I don't know how to fix this. 
I can feel it. I can feel the tension in the air, and I know this teacher's not happy with me, but I don't know how, I don't know what the next step is. And that's where the teacher is going to say, so, it's been a tough morning. Yeah, it's been a tough morning. All right, so what's your plan for coming back? Because we need you back in there. Well, I'm just going to try real hard. How about we be a little more specific about that? So when you want to just shout out an answer, what should you do? Let's have a plan for that. I have a suggestion. Great. I'm so glad that you're willing to make that choice. Please, I'm welcoming you back into my classroom. So teachers are going to demonstrate to students, how do we fix relationships when we break them? That's one of the hardest things about living in a community is we are going to do it. It's just inevitable. But how do we fix it when we break it? All right, so this is the, the part you probably wanted to know a little more about. And if there's some students in here, I'm not going to give away too much. But like I said, if we are going to tell our students that they have to leave pop culture at the door, anything on social media, anything having to do with politics, anything having to do with movies, uh, pop music, then we need to put something in its place. So... Uh, I've had some experience over the last couple of years of building a house system at Great Hearts Northern Oaks. Uh, it's actually a really, really old system. So it actually started back in Greece. And when there were tutors um, where a, a family would hire a tutor, he would also have other students. And then those students decided they would really like to compete against other students in athletic events. So one tutor with his group of five or six would bond with another tutor of five or six, and they would create a house. And then that house would go and compete against another group of tutors and their house. And that's where the house systems were born, and you see them most often in uh, uh, universities and high schools across Europe. You might have heard about it through Harry Potter, but that's not where it came from. She did not make it up herself. I promise it's a whole lot older, older than that. So in our house system, what we hope to do is teach students how to live in community, give them something bigger than themselves to identify with, give them the opportunity to compete, and take pride in something. So we, have, we will have, um, say it this way, we'll have eight clans, four houses, two realms, under one Spartan family. And we will always say that while we are house blank, 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 and blank, we are Spartans first and last. And I'm not giving away the names of our houses. They are, uh, so I, two realms, four houses, eight clans. Um, and uh, fifth through eighth grade students will be inducted into their house at eight o'clock on Wednesday morning. And there will be some new traditions and some new things born. And uh, Mr. Travis promises to give a few hints to the family community. But there is a lot of it that's pretty special that is just for the students here. They will be inducted into their houses. They will be given five patches. Those five patches need to be on any piece of uniform that they wear. We ask that they wear it on their left sleeve here. Um, and if they end up wearing a sweater, it can either go here or above the Gray Hearts logo here. Um, but any time they are on campus, their house should be visible. The patch does have a symbol for their house and has the Spartan helmet on it. So both icons are there. So they will need to wear that. Every house must field an intramural team during each of our seasons. And because there is a uh, two, I'm sorry, there's two clans in every house, and every house needs a boys team and a girls team. We will have 16 teams competing in intramurals every sports season. Our intramural season for the fall is boys flag football and girls volleyball. And our athletic director has already devised the entire season and is in the process of getting uh, referees for all of our intramural games. We um, are also in conversation with our friends at Northern Oaks across town to see if we can't have a competition against their winning, their champion flag football team against ours at the end of the season. Uh, so we have a lot of exciting things to go on with intramurals. Students will also be able to participate in clubs. They're going to have to start making some choices, though. There's going to be some days where they may have a house, uh, there might be a competition going on where they need to be uh, uh, practicing with our house for, for flag football or volleyball, and there might be a club that they're interested in. We'll do our best to coordinate with the club coordinator to try to make as many fifth or eighth grade clubs available on days, uh, enough of them available so that they could at least do a club and do a sport. About half of our students at Northern Oaks came out for every season. The reason why, my house needs me, 
and I need to be out there. And so a lot of students who had never played those sports before came out because their house needed them. It's an opportunity for all students to get the opportunity to play. Uh, this year we are building our athletic program through intramurals. Seventh and eighth graders, this is a year to really hone skills. Next year uh, we will be in the textile league um, and we're already got our eyes set on the UIL. As a former basketball coach though, I know that if you are thrown into competition that is light years ahead of you. It's very demoralizing to have a losing season and lose every single game. So our goal here is to give everyone the opportunity to grow. We will have cross country, um, and they will have some. Uh, they will go to some meets, and those are outside the house system. So uh, Coach Travis Chisholm has already been setting up. If you're interested and didn't hear about cross country. Um, make sure that you go on the website, find his email, send him an email about cross country. Uh, that's for seventh and eighth grade. And then seventh and eighth grade will also have the ability to do track and field at the end of the year. And we will try to jump into some textile events with that. Uh, so that is everything to do with the house system and intramurals. More information will be coming out after the first choosing ceremony on Wednesday. So this is a special year, and that's the reason why the 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders are all in the upper school building this year. If we were going to la launch a house system, uh, I wanted them all to be together in the same community. Every Friday they will have a, uh, every day they have Lyceum. On Friday's Lyceum there will be house competitions and house meetings, um, an opportunity to, uh, to get to know each other here. So if they don't ever in, uh, go to an intramural uh, sport, they still will be involved in activities through their house. We will have athletic field day, academic field day, um, and other competitions like Poetry Wars throughout the year. So there's lots of different things that will happen at the school, and then a lot of opportunities for people to jump in. And if you, as a parent, would like to wear any house swag, you're certainly welcome to join a team and, and get involved that way. All right, so let's look just real quickly at a couple things in the family handbook. If you grab some, some tabs that were available on the table, this is like your, I hopefully there's got enough information here. It's kind of like a Bible, and I like to make sure that you've annotated it or you've tabbed it so that you know when I have a question, I at least can know where to go. It is on the website, so if you do, uh, don't mark up anything or you lose this, you do have the ability to go on the website and look at the, the family handbook. Um, let's look first at uniforms. That is on page 109, 108 and 109 is the beginning of that. Quite a few pages because we did include everything for K through 8. I know that there's quite a few people who have mentioned that the uh, uniform store has been short on uniform tops. We will give, obviously, some grace in the first couple of weeks. If you uh, were a f uh, fourth grader last year going into fifth grade um, and you can't seem, uh, I think, what would it be? Seventh and eighth graders who wear a navy blue. So we had some people who said, I'm a sixth grader. I have the pale blue shirts. I don't want to buy anything in the meantime. I've ordered the navy blue shirts. Can I wear the light blue shirt until the navy blue shirts come in? And that is definitely acceptable. Um, so we will give you grace on those things. I wouldn't sew a house patch onto that. I would just pin it on until your shirts came in. The next important one is about attendance. So if you look at... Page 83, there's quite a bit of information about attendance, and for those of you who have eighth graders, knowing that next year is the first year of high school, it's important to pay attention to some of these pages in here. This information is all the information that would be a part of an upper school handbook about grading, so please make sure that you're aware of those. Our teachers do a lot of planning for lessons that if your child is not here, we're not the kind of school that does a lot of worksheets. So if your child is absent, you miss, they miss out on the nitty gritty of what the lesson was about. And it's very difficult for a teacher to reinvent that. So they'll certainly do the best they can when your child comes back, but we can't just send you a big old giant packet of work to do, some busy work to do. I do understand that it's a COVID year. Your child may get sick, they may get the flu, they may get COVID, and they'll be home. We will send home makeup packets. We'll try to do the best we can to put the things in there that are most important to what it is that they need to know. But it is important, if all possible, when they are healthy and well, that you not take vacations during the time in which your child should be at school. They really do miss out on conversations 
and they learn, they miss out on the discovery process. We don't do a lot of lecture. So if I were starting a lesson on fractions, I would start with an orange. And we would talk about the components that what made this one orange and how I would write that with numbers. And then I would take the orange apart and break it into pieces and ask the question with this little piece in my hand, is this one orange? Of course, they would all say no. So then we talk about, so then how do I notate that in numeric form? This is one of, you said that was one, then this is one, one of what? It's a one of 12 pieces, so then how do I write that? So that's a discovery time that your child would miss out on if they were not in school. So the Singapore, for those of you who are still fifth graders, you get Singapore math this year, there's a textbook. It lays out a whole lot of pictures, but if, you are any, if you're a parent and you've not been to a lot of the previous lessons, you're looking at it going, what are they asking this for? Why are there blanks? This is not the math I learned. But if you'd come to class, you'd find out it was the math you wished you'd been taught. But if you have to catch your child up in the middle of a fraction lesson two weeks in, it's kind of hard because you're kind of going in the middle. So we don't want you to have to do that. So I know sometimes it's one of those mornings where you just don't want to get up. And then you tell yourself, well, if I get there by 10, at least they're there for attendance. But your child just missed out on two hours of education that's really difficult for us to, to reinvent. So please make sure your child is here for attendance as many days as possible. Uh, if you look at page 85, tardiness. We're going to be real sticklers this year about your child being here on time. Parking lot opens at 7.15. First car door op opens at 7.20. Your child will be allowed into the classroom at 7.35 for 15 minutes. If your child does get out of the car at 7.20, there will be a place for them to play or socialize. The fifth through eighth graders will be here in the gym, be able to socialize until the, the bell rings at 7.35, and then they're expected to hit their locker, get their things, make sure they're ready for class. Fifth through sixth graders, if you miss, if you don't get to class by 7.50, you miss the first 10 minutes. There's quite a few things that your teachers do in that beginning time, which means that you're going to miss the first 10 minutes of recess to take care of those things. Seventh and eighth graders, you'll just get an infraction. And when you get five infractions, you get a detention. You get a lunch detention. So you're completely up to you. You can get one, uh, one tardy infraction. Then maybe you get a belt infraction. However they total up, then you end up with a lunch detention. Uh, at the end of the quarter, all the infractions are wiped clean, and you start over again. So uh, fifth and sixth graders, we want you to know that what you miss at the beginning of the day, just like a K-4 student, we will keep you in the first 10 minutes of recess to get that stuff made up. Seventh and eighth graders, you're on your own. You're just going to get an infraction, and whatever it is you missed by being tardy, you're going to have to maybe use your morning break and go visit your teacher and find out what it is that you missed. It's kind of part of that progression. As you get older, some of the training wheels start coming off, and the habits are up to you to make sure that you hone. The next thing down at the bottom of the page on page 85 is makeup work. I know that a lot of you are probably concerned about that, just knowing that your child may get sick more likely this year than maybe any other year. So uh, it very specific about whether your child is a K-6 student or a 7th or 8th grade student. How do I get makeup work? So please make sure that you read that. There is also a late work policy down toward the bottom of the page on page 86. It basically says that if you turn, if you don't have your homework turned in at the first thing in the morning and you turn it in at the end of the day, you get 10% off. If you turn it in the next morning, it's 50% off and then it works the way down. It's important that we be people of integrity and our yes be yes and our no be no and we follow through on our commitments. Discipline. If you flip to page 91, the very bottom of the page starts this, the, that subject area. Uh, the next two pages has the student code of conduct and the academy honor code. If you want to know all of the consequences for somebody if they bring something violent to school and all that sort of stuff, it's at the back. We just don't have very many of those things, so we don't focus on them. What I want to focus on is if your child struggles with the habits of being a student in the classroom, they will probably visit my friend, Mr. Griffin, quite often. And that's okay if they need that. It is not the end of the world. So if maybe when you were growing up, if somebody went to the principal, it was a once in a lifetime horror that happened and it should never happen again. We don't encourage it, but we, it's not something to be horrified. So if your child gets five infractions and they get a lunch detention, 
Hopefully it's not becoming a habit. If you find out that your, your child has had a lunch detention three times in a week, you might want to find out what habits are they struggling with and how can I help them. If you don't, Mr. Griffin will probably get in touch with you and have a conversation. If your child is seeing Mr. Griffin often because he's disrupting the community in the classroom and making it difficult for himself and others to learn, he will reach out to you and he will say, here's what we're doing at school. How can you help us know what we should do, uh, what things seem to work for you? Here's basically the boundaries. And we need him or her now to make some better decisions. And here's how we're going to scaffold them to that. So uh, if you have a child who struggles, please don't, don't feel bad for us. We love coming alongside of your child. Please work with us, okay? We are not only here to educate your child, but all the other children who come as well. And so it's important that they learn, how do I live in community? I'm not the only one here, and I'm just as important as everybody else. So look over that. The students will be signing that student code of conduct and the student honor code. One has to do with academics, and the other one has to do with student behavior. Homework expectations is on page, I believe it's 39, page 39. So you see the progression of time. It says that fifth graders should have 60 to 75 minutes of homework, sixth graders approximately 75 to 90, and seventh and eighth graders approximately 85 to 115. That is not a minimum. That, that should be a maximum. So you, you don't need to expect that I will always, or your child will always have that much homework. Uh, keep in mind, your child will have a 35-minute lyceum at the end of the day. So after, for 7th and 8th graders, after 6th period, you will go to lyceum. 5th and 6th graders will have lyceum, and that's where it's an opportunity to do their homework um, and receive help. The math teachers will always be available during lyceum for help. Um, and it will be a place to get at least some of the work started, if not finished. I know that <clears throat> my junior son, when he was a junior and then a senior, seemed to almost never have homework a good portion of the year. And he was just really diligent during his lyceum. And then I found out that he was being maybe not completely honest with how much work he should do at home, but he got all the paperwork part done. So please challenge your, sti your student that just because they filled out all of the things that had to be written doesn't mean that you're necessarily finished because studying um, is, is a harder thing to check with a child. I would ask them, so what did you learn in history today? Get out your spiral. Teach me a little something about what you learned in history today. Check to see if they were paying attention in class. So homework, if your child seems to be doing an inordinate amount of homework, more than this right here, please give your child's teacher an email. Maybe it's just the, um, the, the Algebra One teacher. It seems that he's working longer with that assignment. The teachers sometimes need to recalibrate. Sometimes they forget what it's like to be a student, and they're just so excited about their subject area, and they forget that there are five other subjects in seventh and eighth grade. They will have a test calendar, so that means that uh, they will keep track. You've got a test on there for Algebra one. We're not putting the history test there. We're going to move it over here. So they will do their best not to overload your student. You will, the student shouldn't ever have more than two large tests on one school day, um, and we will keep track of those so that that doesn't happen. Uh, students always want to know about R&R &R weekends. R&R &R weekends, we will let you know ahead of time. If for some reason your child finds out that it's an R&R &R weekend and our teachers forgot, they usually tell us first thing Friday morning, I heard it was an R&R &R weekend and my first period teacher gave me homework. So we will, we will fix that. We usually don't get to the end of the day with an R&R &R weekend. We usually fix it because they are paying attention. All right, the thing that you all came here to talk about, the thing that's the bane of your existence, traffic. Page 75. There is both an upper school and lower school traffic flow. Uh, please realize that getting 1,100 students off campus in a timely manner is, is not an easy feat, especially for those of us who are just a bunch of academics who aren't phenoms with things like structures of parking lots. Fortunately, we have a beautiful sized parking lot. It's actually four lanes over there on the upper school side, two for coming and two for going. So my, my hope is, is that this will be the easiest Great Hearts campus to get in and out of on a morning and an afternoon. But I'll be honest with you that we switched, we upgraded. 
I know every time you hear that word upgrade, you go, really? Do I need to upgrade? Is it gonna, what's it going to do to my computer? What's it going to do to my phone? So we upgraded CurbSmart, and there was already some snafu. The whole idea was every family gets one four-digit number. Four, no, three-digit number. Every family gets a three-digit number, and all they have to do when they come in the parking lot is type in those three digits, and every kid in that family will populate and be sent down. Will they somehow, something about people's addresses and a parent or two parents who may be separated having two different addresses, it caused a, a snafu in the system. We spent most of the day today trying to fix all of those. You will get an email from a teacher that will say, please just double check to make sure that your placard has the blank number on it. So if you do see an email from either your seventh and eighth grade first period teacher or from your homeroom teacher K through six, please make sure you look at it. Just make sure that it's there. If you were not there for Meet the Teacher on Friday, please make sure you open that email, get a piece of white paper, write your child's last name on there and the number. Put it in the windshield when you pick them up on Wednesday. Uh, we will make sure. We have a couple of things put in place. I had Mr. Griffin and Mrs. Arredondo sit for about an hour and we went through every possible thing that could go wrong and what was our fix for it because this is not my first traffic rodeo and I the first year that we opened Gray Hearts Northern Oaks we were there till almost six o'clock trying to get our last student out I don't want ever that happen again so we have hopefully planned for that and you will get your child quickly if you have an upper school student and a lower school student this is the lower school side over here all you have to do is come to one side your upper school student will already be packed up beginning of lyceum he does not have to go to his locker again we'll come all the way through grab your lower school sibling and go get in the car if you only have an upper school sibling or child you will only come to the lower the upper school side and pick up over there and i guarantee you that's going to go probably a little bit faster so um, if you have a lower school and upper school, your upper school student will be reminded from his classroom, please make sure you go all the way through this way, through the lower school building, grab your sibling, and head into the car. They just need to know, am I in lane A or lane B, so that they know which side of the, the parking lot to get in. So if you have more questions about traffic, Mr. Griffin would love to talk to you about it afterwards. It's his favorite thing to talk about. Yeah. All right, please, if you don't um, have a pen, just take a quick picture of this. This is important dates, at least for first semester, that I'd like you to be aware of. Uh, curriculum night for fifth through eighth graders is going to be September 8th. It'll be from 6 to 8. Um, we will do everything to help you feel informed about the things your student will be learning. Uh, this semester, you'll actually get the opportunity to go into the classroom and sit in the seat of your student and be a student. So if you are a fifth grade parent, you will get a Singapore lesson and a Spalding lesson. If you are a seventh grade parent, you're gonna get a pre-algebra, probably a pre-algebra lesson, and then you're gonna to go to the lit comp class, and you're gonna get a grammar sentence or two to diagram, and then you're gonna to go to the history class, and you're gonna get some questions about history. So you'll get to sit in the seat of your student. Conference week, or better known as October break, the first three days of that week, we will do parent-teacher conferences. Thursday and Friday, we're gonna give our teachers a break. So those, if you're gonna plan a holiday, please do it at the end of the week. It's so important that you come in person. We will do what we can to maybe set up some Zoom ones, but it's so important that you come in person. Winter music concerts. Uh, you need to note the third through eighth graders, December 9th. You'll wanna check your child's schedule, seventh and eighth graders, to find out what semester your student is having music because they could be having drama first semester and music second semester. Um, so just double check to make sure. I think sixth grade as well are toggling. Are they toggling music, sixth grade? No, they have music all year long. So they're gonna be at that concert. So we will give you more information about that, but that is part of their music grade that they be there for that concert. Uh, winter break, of course, and then independent study week. So independent study week is that week in which your child will be doing a independent study project. They will be doing something research-wise, and they will be doing some sort of hands-on project as well as some writing, and they'll be prepared to present. Friday of that week is a school day. It is the only day that we present. We don't present the following Monday. So please, if you are going to go tobogganing or you're going to go skydiving, just make sure your child is back in time for that Friday and is able to do the presentation. Spirit Days will be the last Friday of each month. 
So we will always make sure that you are aware whether Mr. Travis puts it on Facebook or Instagram or an email. I do all my communication through email. I don't read Facebook. So if you ever want Mrs. Keffer or anybody in the leadership team to know something, please don't post it on Facebook. We don't make communications through there. We don't read it. Um, so if you uh, want to know what's happening, make sure that you check the website or email the school. Finally, clubs will start September 13th. Uh, we want to give uh, intramurals. We'll start the week of uh, Labor Day. So that Tuesday after Labor Day, our first week of intramurals will start. And then the following week, our week of clubs. Hopefully give our kids a couple of weeks to get just school under their belt before we add in all those extracurriculars. All right, so how can a parent help support their student as they focus on exercising their minds, their bodies, and their souls this year? I'm going to surprise you with this answer. And the, uh, the headmaster for my daughter, when I first came to Greyheart, said this at the very beginning of the year, and I was shocked. He said, let your child struggle. Wait a minute. Let them struggle? But my whole job is to rescue them from anything bad and horrible. I mean, there is that temptation. If you're in the aisle of the grocery store and there's a 50-cent piece of candy right there and that's going to keep your child quiet and why, what does that matter? He hasn't had candy in a while and he should have it. I can't afford it. My mother couldn't afford it, but I can afford it, so I'm going to buy it for him. Your child needs to have the opportunity to build the character that you have through the struggles. I know that it's hard for us to think of some of the horrible struggles we've been through and there's this desire to rescue them from any of those struggles, but you wouldn't be the person today that's sitting in this chair today if those struggles didn't happen and you didn't have a cheerleader to stand alongside of you. So your job is cheerleader. Wow, this is really tough. I am so sorry that that person said that thing to you at school. How are you going to get your voice and say something in response? If he's going to make fun of the other kids at the table, what should you say? I said something, Mom. All right, well, did you let Mr. Griffin know what's going on? He needs to be a self-advocate. So help, be his cheerleader. If the student is not getting their homework done and he's up at 9 o'clock at night and you know that he was doing a few other things before he got his homework done and suddenly now he's getting his homework out but bedtime's 9 o'clock. Bedtime's 9 o'clock. Sorry, you're going to go to school. I know the makeup work policy. I know the late work policy. I hope that you plan to use your lyceum tomorrow, or I hope you use the, your morning break to find the study hall, get that thing done, and won't let that happen again. So please, don't rescue your child from hard things. Now, obviously, there's going to be some things in which there's going to be an imbalance of power, something along that line, something the school should know. But hopefully you're going to help your child have a voice. And they're going to speak up and that they will also speak out and they will find someone who they can have help. And I know that our teachers and Mr. Griffin are here to support our students and how to build a healthy community. We just don't have very many cases of bullying on campus because our students know that this is a place in which we are supporting things that are true, good, and beautiful. And they like it that way. And they don't want this going on anymore. And so they speak up. So please, don't be a snowplow parent. Don't do a snowblower in front of your kid and make a clean path for them to walk on, but be their cheerleader when they struggle and hold fast to those values that you have at home and don't let them get out of consequences. They're good for them. All right, my friend Mr. Travis wants to tell you some other ways in which you as a parent can help our school in this Spartan community. Good afternoon, my name is Ryan Travis. We'll be respectful of y'all's time. Uh, thank y'all for being here. How many new families do we have? We already asked about the old family. New. Wow, it's a lot. Okay, great. Welcome. Yeah. We're very excited that you're here. How's it feeling? Is it, are we excited? It's welling up. Does all this seem strange? It's a little strange. House system. I can tell you that I was a product of a house system in an upper school at a classical academy, and it was amazing. It brought a lot of rich culture uh, to the day-to-day -to -day school experience, but it also made a lot of opportunities for parents to get to know each other. So um, that's kind of what I'm all about. I'm the director of community engagement here. 
Um, I joined in the spring, so I'm like you, new families. I'm a little bit new. Um, when I came here, one of the first things that folks asked me was, uh, how can I help? How can I get involved? And here we have, we could do the, kind of the three T's. We do time, talent, and treasure. We're always going to value your time and your talent. If your talent is flipping pancakes, we want it. If you've got a little bit of time on a Saturday morning to help some families with an event at the school that supports faculty, we want it. If your talent is organizing library books, we really want that. And copy, copy room talents, very needed at a school. Um, we're always going to want that. Uh, connect with me if you would like to get involved with the PSO. I have a direct line to them. And the PSO is just the Parent Service Organization for New Families. You're already a part of that because you're a family here. Um, and so we can connect you with the leadership there that could tell you more about it. And the other thing is treasure. So probably the best way that you can support um, your scholar here directly is by supporting their teachers. We get to hire amazing faculty. We attract Latin teachers. We attract people who are passionate about calculus eventually and the liberal arts and history um, and want to invite your students into uh, a world where they get to think critically. And in order to hire and retain those people, we have to uh, find ways to support them. So we find ourselves as a charter school in a little bit of a unique financial situation. We get about 85% of what the school uh, schools around us do. We don't collect any of the money from the taxes. We've all enjoyed our property values rising here in San Antonio. Great Hearts does not get to enjoy that. Um, so what you end up with is about a $1,700 gap per student per year um, that Great Hearts has to uh, come up with. So here at Great Hearts, there's something called, oh, and there's no funding for facilities at all. So this beautiful building, all of this was made because of Great Hearts and the way that they're able to fundraise. Um, so parents are invited to step into that gap as well. Parents are invited um, to have a meaningful relationship with making that gap available. Again, like I said, I got to be part of a classical education. It was a private school. I was very lucky. I can tell you that this is a private school education for free. It's tuition free. Hear me when I say that. Um, it's just a very unique place. So the community investment campaign is a way that Great Hearts is able to invite families and grandparents um, and friends of Great Hearts into making all of this happen. Um, we have to kind of fill that gap um, together. So my family, my wife and I, we have a puppy, we have three chickens. We don't have a scholar here yet, but uh, we give $100 a month um, because we believe in what's happening with your students here. Um, and that's a that's similar to what Great Hearts invites you to, um, is just $100 a month, um, which comes out to $1,200 a year to help fill that gap um, and make this elite education available out here on the west side. Um, it's a really exciting thing to uh, be part of. I know that I um, feel the mission deeply, and so you are also invited to be part of that as well. Um, Signing up for it is easy. On the website, there's Donate. You can always come talk to me. Money is weird. I'm happy to talk through um, any of the details that you have questions about. Um, but we're invited to all fill into this gap um, together, and your parental involvement is, is of the utmost importance to us. So time, talent, and treasure, those are the things you'll hear us talking about. But I just want to say thank you for showing up, for maybe ending your dinner um, a little bit early so that you could come here or for finding child care. It is very meaningful that you're here, and this is an opportunity for all of us to catch a vision. Uh, Ms. Keffer, did you want to answer some questions? You all got to submit some questions online, and Ms. Keffer is going to riff. Let's see if I can answer a few of the questions that, that um, were asked. I know that the first one um, and we've had a couple of these, is that uh, parents want to know why eighth grade doesn't have PE. Um, so when, when I was hired to take over um, in mid-May, the most of the hiring was already done, and all the hiring that was supposed to be done was set in place, and the headmaster ahead of me had decided that the eighth graders were not going to have PE. He had set up art in its place, 
but I couldn't find an art teacher who would come and just teach two sections of art, but I did have a teacher who had about 15 years of theater experience, and so we are going to have drama. Drama uh, or theater is typically done in sixth grade and junior year. So uh, your students missed out on that in sixth grade, so I thought, how about we gift it back to them and give them the opportunity to have drama. Um, if you purchased a PE uniform and you haven't taken off the tags, I know that the uniform store will take it back. If you did take off the tags, you will need at least one year of it for high school credit. You do have to take it, so we will be offering it. Um, so uh, I apologize for that. If you ordered a art sketchbook and you did not, you recognized on there that your child is not having art because originally it was art. Um, if you will let Mrs. Cape know, she will reimburse you for it. You bring that thing down here without it being used, bring it down, we will reimburse it to you, we will give it to a student who needs it. Um, so I apologize, I was completely out of, of my hands, um, but your student is on track to receive all of the fine arts and all of the common arts and all of the uh, rigorous education moving forward. Uh, you will not be missing out on anything, but I do apologize for the convenience that you did go through in purchasing those things. Um, one of the things that somebody asked in an email was um, I mentioned some big traditions and what are some of those traditions that I plan to bring to Western Hills. Um, it, it simply is mostly embodied in the house system. The house system births so many other things. It's a way for your child to have an identity in something bigger than themselves, something more important than themselves, and a way to give, to give back to the student community and to the community at large. They will be doing some service projects. They will be doing competition. Um, and if you know anything about sports and if you've participated in sports, it's that opportunity, competition births the opportunity to test your virtue at the highest level. Because if I have to be, I want to be aggressive but not cruel. If I want to be, have a lot of spirit and be excited for my team but I want to be a gracious winner, there's all kinds of things that are learned through that. Um, so there's some traditions that you will find about, out about from your student. Hopefully it is a really fascinating conversation at your dinner table Wednesday night about all of what they saw will be just the tip of the iceberg of what the house system will do for them over the next couple of years. As your child grows, if your child is a seventh or eighth grader this year, the house system will grow into the upper school. Most house systems that are done in around the world are done only in upper schools, and um, those that they become upperclassmen become mentors, and they are what we call keepers of the culture. And so they will be taking on leadership roles in the house and helping to grow the traditions and carry them on to the next generation. So uh, this is not something just for the younger age, so it will grow with them. So once they're in a house, they will stay with the house all the way through. Um, what was the reasoning behind not having competitive sports this year? Um, and I did think I talked to that in the, in the beginning. We'll do our best to bring as much competition as possible, uh, but most of it will be in-house through intramurals. Um, students that join intramurals are more likely the students that are already active and enjoy sports. PE targets all students, especially those who tend to be more sedentary and in need of activity. Um, and I agree with that. There's, there's going to be lots of opportunity throughout the school day. There will be opportunity for students to do things during their morning break. So if you're a seventh and eighth grade parent, they will have periods one and two. Then they'll have a, a morning break. Then they'll have periods three and four. They will have lunch slash recess. And then they will have periods five and six. And then they'll have a lyceum. So a lot of movement throughout the day. Lots of opportunities for physical sort of movement. Um, and I hope that we will attract many of them to our after school activities. All right, I'm going to wrap up the year. I know uh, the, the t our time here. If you have specific questions, I know some of you may have specific concerns about COVID and how we are handling that this year. Uh, please specifically come up and ask me those questions or feel free to send me an email. Thanks again for coming tonight. This means a lot to us that you would take the time tonight so that we can partner together for the success of your student. See your scholar on Wednesday.